All right, we're going to uh, be picking up with what does Jesus have to say about. You know, we've looked at some important stuff already. We've looked at what does Jesus have to say about himself? What does Jesus have to say about faith? About salvation? About the scriptures? About the priorities of life? About money? And you start thinking about all of that and you say, well, what else is there to cover? We're just getting started. <laughs> He's got a lot to say about a lot of stuff. And tonight we're going to take a look. You know, you think of, you think of Christmas and obviously you think of, of the baby in the manger. You think of Jesus. And probably your second thought has to do with children. You think about children at Christmas time. So what does Jesus have to say about children? And we're going to, going to start taking a look at that. And um, I don't know if you've been on our Facebook page in the last couple of days. But I asked the question, and several people responded to it. And I thought they gave some great answers. And it's kind of a trip down memory lane, and, and maybe you can think of your own. The question is, can you share a good memory from your childhood about the church you grew up in? And I, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to share a few of them, because I think it's really, it's really cool what some people have said. Debbie says, I grew up in this church. And even attended, attended kindergarten here. I also was involved in choir, Sunday school, and Bible school. Both of my parents were very involved in church activities. They, along with many loving leaders through my childhood, helped to form a lasting Christian foundation for my walk with Christ. Lots of great memories, she said. Bethany responded and said, Talked about her own daughter, Kylie, and said, Kylie's response is she loves her memory since coming here to First Baptist Church. Now, that's really cool to hear, right? And Bethany remember being a, when she was a kid at, at a life center in Tacoma, Washington. This is a really big church, and they put on these big plays and productions, and she was involved in those, and they were, they were even often televised. She said, I really love knowing how many people we were reaching with the message and I enjoy playing a part in it. That's a great memory. Kay. Kay said, I remember the loving lessons, impact, and examples of Christian living shown by adult ladies at Highland Baptist Church during my preschool and elementary years. Kay, I'm impressed you remember your preschool years. That's pretty cool. Good folks like, and, and remembering names, Dot Gwen, Dink McClung, Muriel Dressler, and my dear Aunt Betsy Gillian. During my high school years, my youth leader at Oakwood Baptist was very influential in my Christian growth. I remember all these fine folks with fondness and great appreciation because they took time to care. There's some messages in here, isn't there? Jana says, I still remember going up for the children's sermon. Love the stories and having personal time with our minister. I even got one over on him during a conversation during one of those children's stories, which I'm sure he conceded just so we can move along. But I remember it was just like yesterday. Loved my church and when I, when I was a youngster. That's why I'm so happy here at, at FBCSA. So similar in love and caring for the congregation and service. Thank you for welcome, welcoming me to the church. I finally found a home. Truly mean this. I hope at some point I will be a blessing to everyone here uh, as FBC has been to me. I really got a kick out of uh, Patricia's response. She says, I remember your mom, my mom, singing solos. That's really cool. Paula said, my fondest memories growing up at this church was playing church league softball and church league basketball. Frank and Sissy Offit were our basketball coaches, and Richard and Mary Mays were our softball coaches. We always had a lot of fun. Jerry said, I'm told the first place my mother took me as a newborn was the church, confirming how blessed I am. I still recall the wonderful Sunday school teachers. Angie said, well, I was involved in many churches because I was born into youth ministry. I remember going on youth events when I was five years old. When I was eight, my dad got involved in a bus ministry, and I would ride with him on many transports. 
also playing and watching church league basketball and softball. The many people I've been blessed to include in my church family. Robin talks about, I grew up in Judson Baptist in Bell. My mother was the senior high youth leader and my dad would drive the church bus. And wherever the youth went, my sisters and I got to go too. When I was nine years old, the choir director took a chance on me and let me play the piano for the children's choir. Did y'all hear that? When I was nine years old, I loved going to the BYF rallies, church camps, children and youth choirs. FBCSA reminds me of growing up in Judson. Jones said, I grew up in a small United Methodist church in Huntington, the center of the neighborhood. And from my earliest memories, we were always at church. My grandmother was the choir director and pianist, Sunday school, junior church, VBS, church plays, cantatas, United Methodist Youth Fellowship, church camp, church retreats, church socials. Revivals all hold very special memories for me. Joel, this question really took me down memory lane. And Rose said, I remember youth camp and youth trips, being with young people my age from all over the area. Most of all, I remember the teachers of the Sunday school classes and youth leaders and the influence those events and leaders still have on my life. Deborah said, I had the best experience at Dunbar First Baptist from a baby to 19 years old when I was married and taken away. I've always sensed the peace being in church. I remember uh, the pastor I had, Reverend George Polly, and the family camps at Camp Virgil Tate, Camp Cowan, youth conventions, revivals. Goodness, I felt like half my life was in the church, and I loved every minute of it. I love the people in that church, both young and old. FBC reminds me of the church I grew up in. Wonderful memories then and wonderful memories now. One more, Jenny. FBC has been my church home for my entire life. It is so intertwined in memories of childhood and growing up, it's hard to separate it from the rest of my childhood. I remember Sunday school, choir, youth group, bell choir, Bible school, etc., it just basically felt like home. It was an integral part of day, of the day-to-day -day life. And I really can't imagine what it would feel like to not have FBC in my life or to be a member of any other church. So maybe that'll get you thinking. Uh, get some thoughts sparked about, about uh, your memories of, of, of growing up and, and, and something, something that might... Touch, touch your life. But did you pick up a theme there? Anything strike you that you heard in those? At least, you know, of course, of course, I did ask a specific question. Think about your, your childhood, a childhood memory. But almost everybody that, that responded talked about how involved they were. Talked about how their parents had them involved in, in the church growing up, and, and, uh, and they just kind of soaked it all in. And all of it was a part of forming who they are. And, and uh, I think that's a, and I think as we go look at this, this, this study about what Jesus has to say about children, I think that's a, that's a theme we're going to see. Um, you know, that, that we've got a real responsibility as, as adults, as parents and grandparents, uh, with, with our children. So I think there's three basic truths we're going to discover here. Number one is children are precious in Jesus' sight. Absolutely precious. I don't think that surprises anybody. The second thing I think we're going to see is that adults have an incredible responsibility to care for and to nurture and to teach children in the ways of the Lord. And the third thing is, in their own way, children are, are, children are our model for entering the kingdom of heaven. And we'll take a look at, at how that is. So I'd like you to turn to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, to get us started. Matthew 19, verses 13 through 15.
Matthew 19, verse 13, then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. Probably one of my favorite stained glass windows is not in this sanctuary. But if you go outside and walk up the steps to the second floor, there's a beautiful stained glass window of Jesus and the children. I don't know if you've ever really noticed that there before. But if you haven't, you might take a journey there sometime, especially in the daytime. You see it pretty good. So in your mind's eye, you picture parents bringing their children to Jesus with a simple desire. That he would place his hands on them and pray for them. Would you and I not love to do that with our children and grandchildren? To actually bring them into the presence of Jesus for him to touch them. And to pray for them. I mean what a special time. And and, I mean my my heart is connected with these parents. Because I, I man I get where they're coming from. And and I think it's a it's a beautiful picture. And yet, the disciples rebuked them for doing that. Now, why in the world would the disciples rebuke parents for bringing children to Jesus to touch and to pray for them? Now, we, now Jesus would have a lawsuit thrown against him. It's all right. Kid comes up and wants to be hugged. I'm going to hug him. All right? So... Why do you think the the disciples rebuked the parents for bringing their kids to Jesus? Any thoughts? You know, it might have been a long day. It might have been a long couple of days. Jesus, they might have been, they actually might have, I think they were probably really looking out for him and, and thinking, you know what? He needs some rest. He needs some time to just, relax and chill a little bit. That's, that's certainly one possible reason they did it. Can you think of another possible reason? Maybe, maybe they were thinking, look, this is a waste of time because they're not going to pick up on what Jesus is teaching and, uh, and, and they're not ready for it. Yep. Maybe, maybe, they, maybe the disciples were tired. <laughs> they just said, we, look, we need, we need some time with Jesus. Just some downtime and some, some rest time. We aren't told. Yeah, we need, we need to come. You're talking about the kids being an example to us? Yes, absolutely. We need to come as, as open as a child is to learn. And, and we're actually going to get into that whole concept as in, a, in another little passage that we're looking at as we go along. Um, Mark tells us, and, and Matthew doesn't have this in here, Mark tells us that Jesus was indignant with the disciples. He was not happy. That, that they were stopping the parents from bringing the children. And he says in, in our passage, and he says in Mark also, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Now, I got a confession to, you, to make. You know, one of the, one of the things I, I have wrestled with through my years of ministry is, is at what age does a child understand what they're, what they're doing? And, uh, and, and you, you just brought it up. And... And I hear it from both sides on parents. I hear it, well, they're not old enough to do that. And then on the other side, I hear, I hear that, you know, you, you need to let them come. This verse is what always settles in my mind. Let the little children come. Do not hinder them. And, you know, one, one of the things I will, well, little, little Anna came, came forward Sunday. Now, will Anna understand the gospel like Ed understands it, like Steve understands it, like Faye understands it. Uh, 
probably not have near the, the grasp, right? But as Anna comes, she's responding. She loves Jesus. That's what she knows. She loves Jesus. That's what she's been taught. That's what mom and dad have taught. That's what the church teaches. That's what her Sunday school teacher teaches. She loves Jesus. And I'll tell you, I don't want to get in the way of that. All right? I want to do whatever we can to encourage that. Now, one of the things I will say to parents is understand where they are and understand that they're going to keep going. And, they're going to, and, if, and you're just starting this journey. You know, you got to keep teaching and keep, keep working with them and walking with them. And I will almost always, I don't think there's an exception to this, I will almost always tell parents of young children that we're about to baptize, they're going to reach a point where they're going to move from the concrete thinking of, this is how I say it, the concrete thinking of what mom and dad and the pastor and the, and the, and the Sunday school teachers teach to working it through in their own mind. You know, when the abstract thinking comes. And, and that can come at any age. That can come in middle school. That can come in high school. A lot of times it comes in college. And uh, which is why, you, you, you know, you keep working to, to keep them grounded as you, as you go along. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yes. There's there's two sides to the coin. Yeah. Right. You can understand. Eric was saying that there's the, there's the flip side. It's not just that that a child loves Jesus, but the child is understanding that Jesus loves the child, loves them. And I like how you put it. There's, they understand that. Well, that's what you need to understand, right? Uh, they may not understand the theology. And if you ask them what atonement is, they'll say, huh? <laughs> you know, you ask a lot of adults what atonement is, they'll go, huh? <laughs> but, you know, you, you still have the, the basic relationship, that, that's why the gospel is so simple when you get right down to it, you know. Don, you, were, you had your hand up. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I missed you. May, okay, so maybe they, maybe they thought, you know, this is the parents' thing and not the kids. And, and probably, I, f- I figure it is the heart of the parent. They want that child to be with, with Jesus, experience the presence of Jesus. We aren't told. I tend to think they were protecting Jesus. I tend to think they were trying to give him some space and some time. And I see Faye, are you, are you thinking? Are you want? Oh, man, I'm telling you, the wheels are turning. I can see it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Good observation. Faye is, Faye is remembering Deuteronomy 6 and, and how, how uh, we're reminded to love the Lord your God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that the parents are to have these commands impressed upon their hearts. And they're to impress them upon their children. 
And that's what these parents were doing. They, they weren't sending. They weren't sending the kids. They were bringing the kids. And, and I think that's a... What's that? Okay. Man, the light bulbs are going on all over the place tonight. This is the Advent season, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it, uh, maybe just the thought that, that Jesus isn't wanting the people to forget how he came. I mean, he could, he could have come as a, as a conquering king and, and bringing, a, bringing the armies of heaven with him and that's not how he chose to come, born as a baby, right? And, and he's experienced it all coming up, coming up through. He had parents who had to impress upon him the, the, the truths of, of God's word. Now, you guys are, man, you're, the light bulbs are flashing tonight, and, and uh, you're, doing, you're doing great. Um, let, let's, let's think just a minute about, about this statement well, let me finish a thought. I think I, think I was talking about when, when little children come, I tell parents they're going, to, they're going to go through a period of claiming their beliefs for themselves. You know what I'm saying? Where it's not, I believe, not just because mom and dad taught me, not just because my Sunday school teacher taught me, etc. I believe because I believe. And just about everybody's got to go through that. Now, for some, it's a fairly smooth process. Can't hardly tell it's even happening. And as they're growing up and they're involved in, in, in youth and et cetera, that it happens. But for some, it's like a major hurricane in their lives. I think Dobson used to refer to it as going through a class five rapid. And you, and, and you, you get knocked out of the rapid and into the rapid and you're going down without a paddle and you're just, you know, you're just... But the rapid ends, and, and they come out the other side. And, uh, and that's our prayer, right? Because we see it happen all the time. Um, so, so I do try to, to, to warn parents that this, this is real, and it's also just the beginning. It's the start of a journey that's going to go, go a lifetime. In verse 14, Jesus says, let the little children come to me. Little children there literally indicates toddlers and infants. I mean, he's really talking about little children. Uh, let them uh, come to me. This thought went through my mind, and, and, and I, I just get a little mushy and syrupy sometimes. But, but Jesus is Jesus, right? And sometimes I, I get this image when, when he's taking a child and he's putting his hands maybe on, on the child's head and he's looking in the eyes of that child. I get this image of what does he see? And, I, and in my mind's eye, he looks at that child and he knows that child and he sees that child and he knows that child's created in his image and knows that child what the vision that, that God has for him and and, and, and the gifts and talents that that, that child has. And I mean, I, I don't know. I, that's a little mushy maybe, but I really think that's kind of what the deal is. He sees every child we have and, and knows who they're created in whose image and knows what they're destined and designed to do. That puts a heavy responsibility on us, on all of us. Uh, well, which we talk about, you know, not to get in the way of, of what, what's going on. Um, I just, it's a beautiful image in my mind. And then the third part of that is, do not hinder them, which is kind of where we were heading with that thought. So let me ask you this. How can we be a hindrance to children and we can include youth in that as well, coming to Jesus. How can we be a hindrance? That's probably not too hard for us to answer, is it? <laughs> Got to start by being an example, right? 
if we want our kids to grow up to know Jesus, to speak it and not live it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Very often. Very often, okay? So we need to model it. I mean, that's how we all learn the best, isn't it? To see an example. To follow an example. We're to follow the example of Christ. And we're to be like Paul, and I think it's 1 Corinthians 11, 1, when he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's kind of who we're to be as adults in the church, as parents, as grandparents. That's, that's what we're to do. That's a great, great point. Eric's saying you're thinking about the example of the, the class five rapid being in the ra- you're in the raft with the child and you're going along with them and you're going to be willing to do whatever you have to do to keep them in that raft or get them back in the raft. You're not going to give up. You're not going to give up. Now, if, if you want to go a whole different direction with that class five rapid thing, there's a guide who will give you specific instructions on how to navigate whatever rapid you face. And if you listen to that guide and you do exactly what that guide says, you will navigate that rapid. If you don't listen, you're going to be up the, up, up the creek without your paddle. It's going, to be, it's going to be a bad situation at that point. Uh, okay, what, okay, how can we be a hindrance? Well, if we don't live what we teach. Okay, what else? (laughs) Okay. Thomas thinking about how when he was growing up as a child, his teachers and those adult leaders in the church respected him, paid attention to him, cared about him. And, and I think that's a, it's a perfect example. And, and one of the things that we think about as adults in the church, whether we have children here or not, is what vibe are we giving off to our children? You know, when they're around us, what, what, what are they picking up from us? Are they picking up that we care about them? Are they picking up that, that, we, that we love them? That, are they picking up that we're glad they're here? That they aren't a nuisance? That they aren't an interruption? That, that we're just happy that they're here? Uh, I think, and, and this kind of gets along with what you're, you're talking about, we can be a hindrance if we are not intentional in our teaching, and, and in, in our modeling. Now, that comes at the individual level as a parent, as a grandparent, but it also comes at the church level, that we have to be intentional. And I, and I have, matter of fact, I have written down what, what you referred to a few minutes ago with Deuteronomy 6. And, and let, me just, let me just read that without really commenting on it because it kind of speaks for itself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. I'm I'm Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. With all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. That's intentionality. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Uh, I, I love verse 20. I like to jump to verse 20 and add it. In the future, when your son asks you, when your daughter asks you, when your child asks you, what's the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws of the Lord our God has commanded us? What's the meaning? And the response is, tell him. 
tell them. Explain it to them. Um, and there is a sense in that passage, as, as Faye was talking about, of Jesus and, and to, to teach our children about Jesus isn't just a Sunday thing. It's a seven-day-a-week thing. It's always. It's really, honestly, it is the number one thing that we seek as parents and grandparents, that, that our children come to know the Lord. That's, that's what we aim for. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that's why I love the thought of, of when you're walking along the road. Well, that's just everyday activity. Like, whatever, there's an opportunity. Natural opportunities come up to talk. Uh, when you're lying down at night, you know, when a child lies down, what a great opportunity before they go to sleep to talk about their day, to talk about uh, what's on their mind, what are they, what are they, what, are they, what, are they, what are they happy about, what are they concerned about, what, what do they want to pray about, what questions are they dealing with? Uh, basically, life immersed in our relationship to God. That's the picture of Deuteronomy six, um, and, and obviously as a church. You know, we, we make, and I think we seek to do that here, and, and that's was one of the things that's made this pandemic so daggone difficult, is, is we, we, we strive to make children's ministries and youth ministries important in the life of the church. And man, it's just been hard during this time. And, uh, but that is something that, that's important, crucially important. Uh, what is it the saying? The children are the future of the church. Well, that's true, right? I mean, one of these days, Bram, he's going to be 30 years old, and he's going to be leading in the church. And old Pastor Joel's going to be singing in the heavenly choir, excited he can sing. And I mean, you know, it, that yes. But can you imagine a church without children? Can you imagine a church without young people? So they're also the church of today. It's not just the future. Uh, and, I, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of churches. There's a lot of churches around our community in, in the state convention that do not have children. And man, that's a, that's a hard place to be. Uh, so it's imperative for us, obviously, as a church to, to maintain and keep Keep that focus uh, in, in ministry. I cannot emphasize enough the importance, and, and I'm, I'm talking to the choir here, cause, but, but I'm talking to everybody that's in the Bible study with us right now. I can't emphasize enough the importance of our interaction with children and youth as we encounter them in the church. I've seen some bad interactions and after some bad interactions, I've watched many of our own adults go rushing over to that child or young person and, and, and kind of immediately seek to make up for it, you know? So we just really have to be, be on our guard. Um, and that kind of brings up a question that I would ask any of us to answer for ourselves. Are children precious in your sight? Are they? Are they precious in your sight? And I think naturally we're all going to say yes, but, but are they by our attitudes, by our countenance, by our words? Would they say they're precious in our sight? I can't tell you, and you see it too, how often we walk through the mall or, or go into a grocery store or walk through a a parking lot at a at a big big box store and and just see parents screaming at their kids screaming at their kids and uh, cussing their kids as if the kids were a nuisance and a bother and they wish they weren't even there and it breaks my heart 
And I'm sure it breaks your heart. Now, can I say there's an opposite end of this we have got to avoid? After saying all that, the opposite end is we cannot put our children and grandchildren in God's place. And I'm seeing that way too often. I'm not talking about our folks. I don't think. We can't make them God. That's not going to help them. That's going, that's going to drag them down. Matter of fact, they're going to think they're all that. They're precious in God's sight. We want them to learn about the Lord. Um, so we need to be careful about that. That's kind of the opposite end of this. There is a warning. And, and the warning actually is found in the previous chapter, Matthew 18, verses 5 and 6. We're going, to, we're going to be leaving one passage for next week. But uh, in Matthew 18, verses 5 and 6, Jesus says, Whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Isn't that interesting? Didn't he say that about somebody else? Who, did he say, who else did he say that about? Whoever, whoever welcomes... The prisoner, those who need clothing and food, those who are hungry and thirsty, whoever feeds one of them is feeding me. And here he says, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Ouch. I didn't know Jesus had mafia ties. I mean, you know, the millstone is, is very large. It's literally a donkey stone, millstone of a donkey. It's a large, circular, flat stone, and it's turned by a donkey on a threshing, thre in, in threshing and grinding of grain and wheat. It's, I mean, you, it's, it's as big and it's heavy. And uh, if, you, if you Google a picture of, of one, He's making a point, isn't he? What's his point? What's Jesus want us to take away from that very strong statement? That stance right up there with gouging your eyes out and cutting off your hand, right? <laughs> What's he want to take away from that? I'm hearing him say, as parents... As a church, as adults, we take ministry to children really earnestly. It, we're, we're, it's, it's important. And the example we set is important. Um, take it very seriously. Now, let me, let me end with this for tonight. This can be very guilt-inducing. Everything we're talking about tonight can absolutely leave us overwhelmed with guilt if we think pretty hard about it. Now, especially if you happen to be at a point in life where your children have already been raised, they're out on their own, and, you, and you, you're looking back and you're, you're thinking, man... You might be thinking anything from I was not there, I screwed it up, I didn't, do, I, I didn't do any of this, to, you know, I was so inconsistent, so sporadic. Da, 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 da. You know, we, we can wear ourselves out right now with this. So let me pose you the question. What would you say to somebody that finds themselves in that place where they are an adult, their children are out of the house. Their children are grown. And they're loaded with guilt about not really carrying out what Jesus said. What would you say? How would you encourage them? Any thought?
Yeah. There you go. Lucille just said, I've been sitting here this whole time thinking about how much better I am at, if I could paraphrase my relationship with the Lord now than I was when the kids were in the house. And now we have a second chance. That's exactly what I would say. You can't. You can't give up. Because, and here, I mean, I've seen this countless times. When you turn your life to the Lord, even let's say, let's say your kids have been out of the house and they're in their 30s and they're raising kids of their own and, 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 you are, and you're thinking, man, I, this wasn't me. Well, it's you now. And when you, open, when you give your life to the Lord, and I don't care what age it is, when you give your life to the Lord and you commit to living for Him and you walk with Him day by day by day, guess what? Your kids, your 30-some-year-old kids, your 20-some-year-old kids are going to see it. They're going to see it. And they're going to keep, now here's the deal, they're going to keep watching. And they're going to want to see, is this real? And what impact is this having on, on your life? It's the same, it's, well, it's not the same. But the impact can be incredible. Yes, Absolutely. There has to be some transparency. And you know what? It's a beautiful thing to write a letter to your child and say, I want to to apologize and tell you how sorry I am that I did not take advantage of the time that I had with you. And and I'm going to do my very best. I'm going to live for the Lord. I love the Lord. He means everything to me. And and that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for your life. And I, I, if I can help you, if you've got questions, if I'll help you any way I can. Letters are a great way to communicate. Uh, because it, it gives the, in this situation, it would give the child time to read and ponder and reflect without having to respond with you in his face. You know? And then they can respond. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean they're going to immediately say, well, man, that's great. They might get angry about it. But that's, that's okay, because as you live consistently, you're going to be an example to them. And I've seen that many, many, many times. And that's a, that's a good thing. So I don't want you walking out of here. I don't want you, if you're worshiping with us or studying with us from home, I don't want you to be thinking, oh my gosh, and, and uh, give up. Because that's not the point of this at all. The, the point is, there's an opportunity always to turn to the Lord and to walk with Him, no matter where you are, to be able to do that. Okay. You sure can. Sure. Well, thank you, Caitlin. How old is Bram now? He will be five the week of Christmas. Uh, absolutely. And, and she was just talking about how he looks forward, this, this almost five-year-old looks forward to the adults that come up and greet him at church every Sunday morning. And it will even ask if, if, they, if he doesn't see them. Are they, are they sick? Are they out of town? And uh, that's wonderful. That's Intergenerational, right? That's what it is. Intergenerational for us. So, okay. Thanks for sharing that. All right, let's close in prayer. Uh, Next week, you might want to be taking a look at the first four verses of Matthew 18. uh, Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for our time. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and, and... All of the teaching he does. 
help us to take to heart, no matter where we are in this, this journey with children, whether we have any children at home, whether our children are young and, and little, whatever it might be, help us to live in a way that encourages children to walk with you. We thank you for the example of Jesus, his heart for children. God, may none of us ever be a hindrance, but always an encouragement to the children in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you all. Good input tonight.